Praise the Lord. Amen. We'll stand up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for all our brethren, brothers and sisters, young people and older people gathered together in various locations all over Nigeria, all over Africa and even beyond Africa. Lord, we pray as we come to your word today, you open our eyes to see, our hearts to understand and to believe what you are teaching us, Lord, and to live according to that word in Jesus' name. We pray that every doubt and every confusion you take away from our hearts as we study the word together tonight in Jesus' name. Make the believers stronger. Make the leaders and the preachers wiser. And make the kingdom of God to expand as we read and study your word together tonight in Jesus' name. Make this a real Bible school seminary for every one of us, O oh Lord. So that eventually as you thrust out into the ministry, we'll do well in ministry in Jesus' name. That this year will be a year of consolidation. And a year of strength and the knowledge of the Lord in Jesus' name. And the cleansing power in the world will so work within every one of us. And you'll pray in a mighty way by the, by the sword of the word in Jesus' name. Clear up all our confusion and misunderstanding and misinterpretation of your word. That tonight we'll see what you want us to see. Know what you want us to know. And believe the totality of the word and live according to your word. Thank you Lord for the answer tonight. In Jesus name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We're now in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading to you two verses of scripture. We're looking at chapter 5 of Matthew. Verses 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. As you look at that verse 18 once again, it says, For verily I say unto you, for certainly I say unto you, for assuredly without a shadow of doubt I say unto you. This is authority. The authority of Christ. Christ as king. Christ as the very son of God. Christ as a great judge because the father has committed all judgment into his hand. And then he says in such an authoritative manner. This is authority based on knowledge because he is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the last. He is the word personified. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He speaks with the authority of the one that knows the origin of that word. And he knows the finality of that word. And he knows the authority of that word. So he says, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. As you think about the people of the world, both scientists and all the people, whether the common men or the elevated, exalted men, if, if you ask them, what is it that he finds stable on earth? Something so solid, immovable, unshakable, that the sea will never pass away. Or they'll say the sky and the earth. That they ask to them is so solid. They think it's immovable. But Jesus said the word of God is more, more solid, more stable, more steadfast, immovable than even the heaven and the earth. And he said, till heaven and earth shall pass. One judge or one teacher, a judge is like a dot. 
the dot of an eye or a title a little line when you when you want to when you want to write a t and you write it like l and then you cross it it becomes a t that cross of the t that's like the teacher a judge a dot the dot of an eye and the cross of a t shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled it's telling us about the permanence of the word the preservation of the word the preservation of scripture and that's what we're looking at tonight but before we go on i need to clear one point with you look at verse 17 think not that i am come to destroy the law or the prophets and then he says in verse 18 for very lesson to you Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or title or one title shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Have you noticed something there in verse 17? The law or the prophets. But in verse 18, he puts everything together now. Instead of still saying the law, the prophets, or the law and the prophets, he just says the law. That makes you to understand then the law. In verse 18, encompasses together both the law and the prophets. Actually, it means the whole of the Old Testament. And let me show you. Now, when the New Testament says the law, and it's writing that for the whole of the scriptures, for the whole of the Old Testament, and the whole of uh, the scriptures who have been given before this New Testament. Look at Matthew chapter 23. And we're looking at verse 23 there. Uh, you, you see the mention of the law. It says in verse 23, Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, and I've omitted the weightier matters of the law. The weightier matters of the law. He said, if you read the law, you'll see some weighty matters there. And although you are paying tithes, you have omitted the weightier matters of the law. What are they? Number one, he tells us in verse 23. It says, judgment. Number two, mercy. Number three, faith. You know what he's saying? He's saying you'll find judgment, justice in the law and then you find mercy in that law and then you find faith in that law these such ye to have done and not to have and not to leave the other undone the question then is when he says you have omitted the weightier matters of the law where is he referring to in the scriptures and let's look at them in proverbs chapter 21 proverbs chapter 21 what reading from verse 23 in proverbs Chapter 21, reading from verse 23. Here is what it says in verse 23. Proverbs chapter 21, verses 2 and 3. 2 and 3. It says, Every way of man is right in his eyes, but the Lord considereth the hearts to do justice and judgment. And it's more, accept, it's more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. You know what the, what the people, the priests, the scribes and Pharisees, what you know what they're concentrating on? They were concentrating on sacrifice, on the altar, on the temple, on the sanctuary, on their tabernacle, on their synagogue. But the Lord said in Proverbs, he said, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And Jesus said, this is part of the law. The Old Testament is the law. Uh, look at Hosea chapter 6. Because Jesus said, you have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Number one, judgment. Number two, mercy. Hosea chapter 6. We're reading from verse 6. And you'll see where he quoted that from. And he's referring to that as part of the law. Hosea chapter 6 verse 6. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Here is what the Lord is saying. You pay tithes of everything you've got. But you have omitted the weightier matters of the law. What are those weightier matters of the law? You have justice which is judgment. You have mercy. And then it says number three. You have faith. Faith. In Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're reading from verse 20. In verse 20 it says. 
and they rose early in the morning and went forth into the into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God. Have faith in the Lord your God. And then he says, So shall ye be established. Believe his prophets. Have faith in the words given by the Lord through those prophets. And then he says, And ye shall prosper. You will see then what the Lord is referring to as the law. Proverbs is part of that. Hosea is part of that. And Second Chronicles is part of that. I turn to John. In John chapter 10, we're looking at what Jesus Christ is referring to as the law. John chapter 10, verse 34, verse 35. And here are the words of Jesus Christ. And you will see the way he uses the words, the law. In John chapter 10, verse 34, verse 35, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? And, and I said, Ye are gods. Where is that written? Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. He's telling us something when he says the law. He says, I'm referring to the scripture. And when he says the law here, that ye are gods, where is that reaching? Look at the Psalms in Psalm 82. Psalm 82, reading from verse 6. Psalm 82, reading from verse 6. Here it tells us, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. And when Jesus said, it is written in your law that ye are gods, it was actually quoting the Psalms, which means then the Proverbs, that's part of the law, as Jesus used that word. And then Hosea, that's part of the law, as Jesus used the word. And Second Chronicles is part of that law, as Jesus used that word. And then the Psalms is part of the law, as Jesus used that word. And then we come now to First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. First Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 39. And you will see what the apostles also referred to when they said the law. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. Paul the apostle talking to the Corinthians said, go back to the law. And what did he mean by the law? I'll show you now. But he said something you'll find in that law. He said the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to another, and uh, to whom she will, only in the Lord. Dear believer, you marry only in the Lord. But what was he referring to as the law? A uh, look at Malachi chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Malachi chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14. Yet she say, wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between you, between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she the com thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one yet? Had he the residue of the spirit? Wherefore and wherefore one that ye might seek a godly seed, therefore take it to your spirit. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. And the Lord, for the Lord, the God of Israel, says that he hated putting away. He hated divorce. And that's what Paul was referring to. Quoting from Malachi, he said, that's the law. You will see then, as you look at it from Genesis to Malachi, the whole of the Old Testament is the law. And so Jesus Christ, in referring to the law, when he said, very nice unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. It was referring to the Old Testament. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21. In the law, it is written. 
Uh, look at this. Uh, Paul the apostle saying, there's something reaching in the law. In the law, it is reaching with men of other tongues and other lips. Will I speak unto these people? And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. We need to find out then, where is this one reaching? Anywhere we find this reaching that is counted as part of the law. In the law, it is reaching. With men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak unto these people. Yet for all this, they will not listen. Let's look at Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 28. Reading from verse 11, you'll see where Paul the apostle got that, and yet he called it the law. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak unto this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye, ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet. They will not hear. That tells you then that the whole of the Old Testament is what is referred to as the law. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5. The word of God says, study to show yourself. Approved unto God. A man that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why we're studying. That's why we look at the word, analyze it, explain it, apply it to our lives. In Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 17 and verse 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily, certainly, assuredly, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That tells us that the Lord was saying, one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the scripture. Shall in no wise pass from the Old Testament till everything be fulfilled. Have you noticed what Jesus said? Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. Why would anybody think that Jesus Christ came to destroy the law or the prophets? The reason is this. The Pharisees were the people that sat in Moses' seat. They were the people that were the stated official interpreters of the Old Testament for the children of Israel. And they looked at them as men of authority, teachers of authority. They felt that whatever they said was right. But those scribes and Pharisees, they turned the word of God upside down. They were actually teaching the traditions of men. But the people did not know. They thought they were teaching the word of God. And Jesus Christ came opposing their interpretation and they thought and if anybody opposed the pharisees or the sadducees he was opposing the bible because you know it was like the time many years ago when it was the catholic church that was all over the world and the catholic church read the bible in latin and the people did not understand latin and whatever they read to the people, whatever they told the people, they thought that was the word. Until the time of the Reformation came and now we have the Bible in English language and many, many languages of the world. And that was the reason why, you know, all those priests, whenever they read the Latin to the people and they explained whatever they wanted to explain to the people, since they didn't have a copy of the Bible, they, they thought that the interpretation was a correct thing. And you need to understand you that these children of Israel when they were in the Old Testament before the New Testament came, they went into captivity into Babylon and they spent about 70 years there. By the time they came back to this New Testament time they were not speaking Hebrew they didn't understand Hebrew and the Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language. It was the Pharisee that came out and read the Hebrew to them and they didn't understand and the language they were speaking was Aramaic language and now they will interpret to them in the Aramaic language. They didn't understand the original, they didn't understand the interpretation so they felt these were the authorities. But they had modeled the Bible. They had misinterpreted the Bible. They had mutilated the Bible. And they had corrupted the Bible. And Jesus now came and he said, I say unto you, this is the right thing. Because his interpretation was different from the interpretation of the scribes and the Pharisees. The people began to wonder. We thought these were the authorities. How is he contradicting authority? 
That means that he came to destroy the law and the prophets. That's why Jesus said, no, I'm not destroying the law and the prophets. I'm destroying the interpretation of the scribes and the Pharisees. But he needed to tell them and assure them. That's why he said, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one judge or one title shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. We divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, Christ's authority and the scriptures. Christ's authority and the scriptures. Point number two, Christ's affirmation of the scriptures. Christ's affirmation of the scriptures. Number three, Christ's authentication of the scriptures. Let's come to number one, Christ's authority and the scriptures. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5 again, verse 18. For verily I say unto you, that's authority. For verily I say unto you. He spoke with authority. And then he said, if you look at verse uh, 21, ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not kill. And then he goes on in verse 22, but I say unto you, that's authority. He said, this is what you have learned. And the people you learned that from, they were not very sure. And the interpretation was wrong. But I am coming from the bosom of the Father. And I am the Word personified. If you want to have the right interpretation of the Word, that's why I came to give you that interpretation. But I say unto you in verse 27 ye have heard that it was said by them of all time that shall not commit adultery and in verse 28 but i say unto you that's authority he spoke not with apology he spoke not with timidity he spoke not with uncertainty he spoke with assurance this is what you heard before and this is what i come to declare unto you in verse 31 it has been said whosoever shall put away his wife let him give her a writing of divorcement but i say unto you that's authority by the way they recognize that authority was when jesus christ spoke in matthew chapter 7 Matthew chapter 7 verses 28 and 29. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings that the, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority. For he taught them as somebody sure, as somebody certain. As somebody fearless, as somebody bold, to be able to contradict and cancel and criticize and oppose the interpretation of the scribes and the Pharisees. And they recognize that authority. This is the authority of a judge. This is the authority of a king. This is the authority of the eternal one. The authority of Alpha and Omega. But I say unto you. And then they said, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. We're told in Ephesians chapter 1. And let's see how Christ has this authority. Where Christ got this authority in Ephesians chapter 1, reading from verse 20. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power. You see that Christ far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come he had a name greater than the name of the pharisees 
greater than the names of the scribes and greater than the names of the priests and the and the leaders and the teachers of that day and because he has been so exalted far above everyone in heaven and on earth that's why he spoke the way he spoke speaking with authority christ's authority affirming the scriptures and then we're told in philippians chapter five, chapter 2 philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 5 philippians chapter 2 verse 5 let this mind be you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god thought it not to be not robbery to be equal with god he spoke with the authority of god himself he thought it not it not robbery to be equal with god this is the very son of god the word was god and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld this glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and full of truth this is authority this is the teacher come from heaven he came right from the very side of God in heaven and then we're told but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God has highly exalted him wherefore God has highly exalted him like no other man ever was exalted like no other prophet ever was exalted this this is greater than the authority of a prophet this is God the son himself and then it says God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow that's authority authority that Jesus Christ has such authority and he is the one that affirmed the scriptures he is the one that confirmed the scriptures he is the one that gives attestation testimony to the scriptures and he says the scripture cannot be broken for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law, from the scripture, from the Old Testament, until all be fulfilled. And here we are told he has this name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that jesus is lord then that lord that means somebody having authority somebody having control that everyone should confess him as lord to the glory of god the father and that tells you then that jesus christ had such great authority in fact the bible tells us that he has, is the final voice of the almighty god the final voice in hebrews chapter one hebrews chapter one we're reading from verse one jesus is the final voice of the almighty god hebrews chapter one reading from verse one God, who at sundry times and in diverse places, diverse manners, speak in time past unto the Father by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. He spoke in times past, in various ways, in various manners, but in these last days he has spoken unto us by his Son. Whom he has appointed heir of all things that puts him in authority. By whom also he made the worlds who be in the brightness of his glory. And the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he has by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then the Bible tells us in various ways all those references on your outline. Number one, Jesus Christ is greater than the angels. Anybody greater than all the angels put together, he must have authority. Number two, greater than Moses. Greater than Moses. You see, if he's greater than Moses, the people of Israel thought Moses was the authority of the law. And yet this Christ is greater than Moses. Number three, is greater than the temple and all the priests. 
greater than the high priest of Israel and greater than all the priests of the land. And then number four, greater than Solomon. He was the wisest man in the land of Israel. And Jesus said, a greater than he is here. And then number five is greater than Jonah. You know Jonah, a man like that, when he came to Nineveh. And when they heard the story, he was thrown into the sea. And the whale took him up, swallowed him up. And it was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And the whale swam until he got to the shore of Nineveh. And then he came out. And as he came out, anybody hearing that kind of story? That there was a prophet swallowed up by the whale. And, this, and, it, and that man was in the whale for three days and three nights and he did not die. And he had a message to give. And then he came through Nineveh saying, Hear the word of the Lord yet forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed, shall be overthrown. They said, This man has authority. Because for three days and three nights, see what has happened to him. And now he comes with that message. The God who sent him must have all the power to do whatever he says they will do. And if Jonah had authority and Jesus said, I am greater than Jonah. Jesus Christ has authority. Then number seven is, uh, number six is greater than John the Baptist. Number seven, greater than Abraham and the prophets that finalizes it for the children of israel before abraham was i am abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and he rejoiced the people of israel they knew that they had somebody with them that had authority they said the highest authority the greatest authority they had ever seen his authority is greater than that of angels that of all men that ever lived yet in his authority he confirmed the infallibility of scripture that's the point it is authority with all the great authority he had he didn't modify the scripture he didn't change the scripture he didn't find any error in the scripture he didn't find any mistake in the scripture all he said is i say unto you till heaven and earth pass one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law, from the scripture, till all be fulfilled with his authority. He confirmed the scripture. Nothing to correct in the scripture. Nothing to change in the scripture. Nothing to modify. Nothing to amend in the scripture. That's the authority with which Jesus Christ spoke. Let's come to point number two. Christ's affirmation of the scriptures. He affirmed. He affirmed the scriptures, Christ's affirmation of the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law. Now you understand the law, the Old Testament, the entire scripture, till all be fulfilled in luke chapter 16 luke chapter 16 reading from verse 17 luke 16 verse 17 it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one teacher of the law to fail you understand that uh, what he's saying is it's easier when you when you wake up tomorrow and then you're coming to midday and you look up and you see the sun then jesus said as part of the heaven and the earth that's part of the universe look at that sun very well it is easier for that sun to stop shining to pass away to fall off to be forgotten than one jot or one teacher to pass from the law have you been to a big city like our city here as you, you know, if you were here about 20 years ago you know the city was there and the city is still there and then think about it the lord is saying as you look at this big city it is easier for this whole city to pass away to just just evaporate into thin air for all the houses and all the land everything to pass away than for one jot or one chitul to pass away when you look at the map you see the you see the country nigeria you see ghana you see kenya you see all those countries and then jesus said look at your map and see the whole continent of africa and then jesus said it is easier for the whole of africa 
the whole forest and the mountains and the ocean and the sea. It is easier for everything to pass away and then you don't see it anymore in existence than for one judge or one cheetah to pass from the law. Not only Africa, for the whole world. It says when you see the whole globe that you wake up the following, the, the following morning, maybe tomorrow morning, and then you say, there is no us again, no continent again. Jesus said, can you imagine that happening? You say, no, I cannot imagine that. Then it said, if you cannot imagine that, how can you imagine that one judge or one teacher will ever pass away from the law of God, from the word of God, without being fulfilled. If you think the earth is stable and solid and steadfast and immovable, the word of God is more stable and steadfast and immovable. It tells us, look at that again, in Luke chapter 16 verse 17, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one teacher of the law to fail. It is clear then to every sincere reader of the Gospels that Christ affirmed the Old Testament. In which way? Number one, as inspired by God. He said this is the word inspired by God. Number two, as infallible infallible no error in it at all number one it's inspired this is what god breathed out and became because it came from the very mind of god from the very heart of god inspired by god that's why it cannot pass away number two it's infallible there's no error in it and there's no mistake in it it's infallible number three it's incorruptible incorruptible if there is anything almighty the almighty god is watching over it's the word of god he watches over his word more than he watches over the whole earth the word of god is more important to the almighty god than all the houses in the world all the oceans in the world all the mountains in the world he watches over his word more than he watches over the whole universe. And we know he watches over the universe. And this word, because of the priority of it, and because of the strength of it, and because of the value, the worth of it, it is incorruptible. Number four, it's indispensable. Indispensable. We cannot do without it. If you think you need anything in the world, like the dust, like the sand, like the water in the ocean you need the word of god more because this almighty god is preserving this world because he knows number four it's indispensable number five it's imperishable imperishable this word of god no it cannot perish and then number five is instructive number six is and number seven is irreproachable you cannot reproach the word of god do you see any beauty in any flower the beauty in the word of god is uh, is greater than the beauty you see in the flowers do you see any 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 good in all the products of the farm the things coming from the earth what you see the value the was in the world is greater than that and do you see any price do you see anything great anything precious in the earth the word of god is more precious because the lord is saying that this word is greater it's more precious it's more valuable than all the things of the earth it's irreproachable number eight is irrevocable the lord has given it and it's not it's not changing it it's irrevocable if the word of god is like that inspired infallible incorruptible and indispensable imperishable instructive irreproachable and irrevocable how you need to then put your faith and your trust and throw your whole weight, your whole life on the word of God to Christ then and to all true believers in Christ the scripture is the word of God that's the bottom line, that's the final scene that Jesus Christ counted the scripture as the word of God, in Luke chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4 Luke chapter 4 we're reading from verse 4 Luke chapter 4 verse 4 here is what it says and Jesus answered him saying it is written man, that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God that's the scripture every word of God Mark chapter 7 
In Mark chapter 7, again, Jesus Christ referred to this word, to the scripture, as the word of God. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 6, he answered and said unto them, Well, as Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, it is reaching these people honoreth me with their leaves, but their heart is far from me. How be each in vain, they do worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Instead of teaching the word of God, they were teaching for doctrine, the word of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold tradition, the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. He says the commandment of God is not the commandment of Moses. And it is not the commandment of the prophets. And it's not the commandment of those teachers in their synagogues. It's the commandment of God. For Moses said unto thy father and thy mother, Whoso causeth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught to his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect. He called it the word of God. Honor your father and your mother. He says, that is the word of God. He says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things ye do. Very clearly then, the Lord Jesus Christ referred to this Bible, to the Old Testament, and of course to the New Testament too, as the word of God. There is no doubt that Jesus believed every jot and every title of the word of God. Have you noticed the way he, he, he spoke in that verse, in verse 18, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Jesus said, verily I say unto you, Whenever he said that, he was impressing upon his hearers of the absolute trustworthiness of scripture. In every minute detail, in those two verses of scripture, our Lord Jesus Christ affirms and confirms the Old Testament. He puts a seal of approval and he puts a stamp of authority upon the whole of the Old Testament canon. Jesus believed it all. Not only just certain parts of the Old Testament, he believed it all. And if you're a real child of God, a follower of Jesus Christ, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, like Jesus, you will believe it all. You'll not just believe a part of scripture. He declared it as the word of God, having a unique authority, which nothing else has ever had, has ever possessed or can ever possess. Those who think they believe, they think they believe in Christ. And yet, they reject the Old Testament. They're deceiving themselves. If Jesus believed, if Jesus affirmed, if Jesus confirmed that the totality of the Old Testament is the word of God, and then you say you believe in Christ, and you're proving yourself to be wiser than Christ, how are you a believer? If we truly believe in Christ as Savior and as Lord, we cannot pretend to be wiser than him. We ought to have the same attitude as they had to the entire word of God. It tells us in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 31. The affirmation of Christ that he gave to the scriptures. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 31. In verse 31, here is what he says, Take, and Then he took unto him the twelve and said, Behold, we, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. All things that are written in the scriptures by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. We're looking at Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1. How did Jesus overcome the devil? 
How did he overcome Satan? By this word. Because he had unshakable faith. Unshakable confidence. Unshakable trust in the scriptures. And when he quoted the scriptures, he quoted it with assurance and confidence and faith. Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was up to water and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. He didn't overcome the devil by the strength of his fasting. Or by the power that he had as the son of God. But by the strength and the power of the scriptures. And he said, it is written. Man shall not lay by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into, an ho into the holy city. And setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Here the devil also quoted the scripture. But you know, he had no authority to quote the scripture. And the scripture in his mouth was a strange foreign thing. It was not in the realm of the spirit to be able to quote the scripture. How can you quote the scripture? How can you quote the word to the word personified? This is the word that became flesh. And he failed. Look at verse 7. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Every time the devil came against the Lord Jesus Christ, he overcame the devil because of his trust in the word, his confidence in the word, his assurance that the word of God is true, infallible, unbreakable. The scripture cannot be broken. In verse 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glories of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. You see his confidence in the word, his trust in the word, the assurance he had, the certainty he had. The unshakable faith he had in the word of God. He said, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. When you are tempted, you'll overcome by the word. We'll come to point number three. Christ's authentication of the scriptures let's come back to this matthew chapter 5 so rich and so deep and so wide and so effective in our hearts matthew chapter 5 verse 18 for verily i say unto you you need to know he's talking this is not moses when Moses said, verily, I, if Moses said, verily, I say unto you, he'll be speaking with borrowed authority. He'll be speaking with acquired authority, just coming from the mountain and his face shining and coming to the children of Israel with that acquired borrowed authority. He could have said, I say unto you, by the authority of the Lord. If Elijah came unto Ahab and he said, I say unto you, it was the authority that was borrowed. It was not an authority that he had that was innate within him originating from him. It will be borrowed authority. I'm coming from the presence of God. But this is God himself. The very son of God telling us, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. 
Nobody ever spoke like this. The prophets never spoke about heaven and earth ever passing away. And then the, the, the people in the Old Testament, they never knew. The scientists of that time and the scientists of this time, they do not know that the heaven and the earth, the sky and the universe will pass away. Here comes the Son of God. Here comes the King of Kings. Here comes the Lord of Lords. And he says, certainly, verily, assuredly, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one judge or one teetle. One judge or one teetle. The Pharisees never thought about that. The way they thought is, what does it matter? If you have a big elephant and then that big elephant loses one leg, what does it matter? What does it matter if you have a lion and that lion loses only one ear? That ear looks like nothing. And to the people at that time, what does it matter? You have the whole word of God from, uh, from Genesis to Malachi. If you lost just one verse, what does that matter? If you have a sheep and then you cut off the wool and you lose the wool, what does that matter? The heart of the thing is still there. And the animal is still almost complete except just little part. But Jesus said, you cannot say that about the word of God. And sometimes you see somebody hold, uh, keeping a Bible and then one page is torn away. And he's still carrying that Bible about. It's like a Pharisee. What does it matter? Even, a, even though a whole sheet is torn and he cannot find that whole sheet, he still has all the other pages. And sometimes you'll find that, you know, somebody has the Bible and something has poured, maybe a liquid has poured on one page. And while he was trying to wipe out the liquid, one word has been erased. And he cannot, he doesn't know what that word is anymore. He says, what does it matter? I still have the whole Bible. Only that this verse or this word is not clear for him. A Pharisee, what does it matter? Jesus said it matters. Get another Bible that is complete. Get another Bible that has all the words, all the verses, all the pages, all the sheets, everything very, very clear. Because Jesus said, I say unto you that heaven until heaven and earth pass, one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And you know, sometimes you have this uh, a kind of adulterated Bible in your hand. And it is not the King James Version of the Bible in English. And, and, the, and the people, the editors will say, we change some words there. They tell you, we change some words there so you can understand. And then as you compare each with the King James Version, the authorized version, you will find that this word has been removed, that word has been removed, and then the people will say, what does it matter? It's still the Bible. I know that this verse has been changed, this one has been changed, but what does it matter? In the majority of the past, it still looks like the King James Version, the authorized version. It matters a lot because Jesus said, one judge... Or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. If I was a member of the congregation, if I was a member of the church, and I found my leader coming to preach, and then if I came near him and I saw that his Bible is all torn, and I saw that, you know, as my pastor my leader is trying to read his bible i look at it and i see that some of the pages are so dirty you cannot see the words there i will not have confidence in him i'll not have confidence in a preacher in a pastor in a leader that doesn't have his bible complete and is buying a car he cannot buy a bible is buying a house is buying light he cannot buy a bible he's changing shares and buying suits he cannot buy a bible i will not have confidence in such a preacher but a preacher that knows that the word of god we need the whole thing the totality of the word of god and he knows that we need every judge every teacher of the word of god to be very clear that's what we need i come back now to matthew chapter 5 verse 18 for verily certainly i say unto you 
till heaven and earth pass. One judge or one cheater shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That's the confidence the Lord has given us concerning the word of God. Look at Psalm 119 verse 18. Psalm 119, sorry, verse 89, 89. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. All that means is that in heaven, before anyone here was born, before any priest, any theologian was ever born. Anybody on earth now, anybody on earth now, before anybody on earth here now was born, the word of God had been settled in heaven. And then he was born. He became a baby. He went to primary school. He went to seminary. And now he comes out of primary school or seminary. And then he says, this Bible, this word of God. And he begins to bring his pen to change it. He cannot do that. This is the word of the ancient of days. And forever the word is settled and concluded in heaven that he has no right he doesn't have the wisdom. He doesn't have the knowledge to change the word of the Almighty God. Verse 152. Verse 152. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Concerning this word of God, the psalmist said, I knew that of all time, that this has been settled forever. Verse 160, 160, thy word is true from beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. That means then the, the, the authenticity of the word is there. We cannot change it. None, nobody is permitted to tamper with it or to change it. We're looking at Isaiah chapter, 4, at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I'm reading from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8. Grass, the grass withereth. The flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. A good amen. amen. That means then this word remains ever true, ever faithful. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. Isaiah chapter 34. Reading from verse 16. It tells us in verse 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her maid. For my mouth it has commanded and, and his spirit it has gathered them. It says it cannot fail. It will not fail. Now, what's, what's to be our attitude to the word of God? And what does this word of God do, accomplish in our lives? Number one, we are saved by the word. That's why you'll not allow anybody to tamper with the word. Anybody trying to tamper with the word is tampering with your salvation. Number one, saved by the word. Number two, searched, sharpened, shaped by the word. We search, it searches us out. And then it shapes us, it molds us to proper shape. It sharpens us. We are searched, sharpened, shaped by the word. Number three, we're strengthened and stabilized by the word. We're strengthened. If you want to be strong as a Christian, strong as a believer, this is what we need. We're strengthened and stabilized by the word. Number four, we're sanctified through the word. Made holy, circumcised through the word. Number five, we're sealed and secure by the word. Sealed and we're secure by the word. Number six, we're submissive to the word. That's what gives us the victory. Number seven, we're successful through the word. Let's come to number one, saved by the word. In Psalm 19, I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 19, reading from verse 7. In Psalm 19, verse 7, here is what it says. The law of the Lord is perfect, 
converting the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. If you find somebody who has been trying to hear the word of God for years and has not been saved, he didn't give his heart to that word. If you're here just once and you give your heart to that word, you give your mind to that word, you'll be saved. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. First Peter chapter 1 verse 23. In First Peter chapter 1 verse 23, here is what it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. If we're preaching the word of God truly, and if we're hearing that word of God with our heart, and we're resting on it and trusting it and believing it, there will be genuine salvation. A kind of salvation that changes the life. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things, old habits pass away. And behold, all things become new. And then your life as a saved soul will be clean by the word of God. And we're looking at John chapter 15. John chapter 15, reading from verse 3. In John chapter 15 verse 3, it says, Now ye are clean through the word. Ye are clean through the word. You are converted by the word. You are cleansed by the word. Ye are clean through the word that which I have spoken unto you. If your heart is dirty, you have not given attention to the word. If your mind is dirty, you have not given attention to the word. If your language is dirty, you have not given attention to the word. If your behavior, your character is dirty and soiled, you have not given attention to the word. If your influence is dirty, you have not given attention to the word. If you give attention to the word, there will be conversion. There will be cleansing. There will be salvation. A kind of salvation that touches life and transforms lives and changes life. Number one, saved by the word. Number two, searched by the word. Sharpened by the word. Shaped by the word. In Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharper than any two-edged sword. If you really give attention to the word, the word is like a sharp sword. And it will cut off irrelevant things from your life. It will cut off redundant behavior from your life. It will cut off unnecessary things from your life. It will cut off the fruitless branches out of your life. If you're coming to the Bible study and you really believe the word of God and accept the word of God, ask the word of God in deed and in truth. All those useless, irrelevant, unproductive areas of your life will be touched, transformed, caught by the word of God. Because it says the word of God, which is a sword of the spirit, is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrows and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart a discerner a discerner it discerns the heart it discerns your intention and it reveals yourself to you and then it leads you back to calvary so you can be cleansed and so you can be washed, and so that your life will be what it ought to be. Number three, we're strengthened and stabilized by the word. It is this word that strengthens us. As Christians, as believers, if you're weak, Satan will take advantage of you. If you're weak, the circumstances of life will take advantage of you. If you're weak in your conviction. If you're weak in your character, if you're weak in your faith, 
The devil will take advantage of you. He'll bring temptation here and there. And then you'll not have any spine, any backbone to stand. And if you want to be strong against the temptations of Satan, it is this word, the word of God, that strengthens us and stabilizes us. In Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 28. Psalm 119, verse 28. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen me, strengthen thou me according to thy word. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments are thy laid before me. Then we're reading from First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 verse 14. First John chapter 2, verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you. It's not just that you are hearing the word of God. Not just that you have the word of God on the outline. It abides in you. You feel your mind and you feel your brain. You feel your heart with the word of God. Every temptation that comes will find the word of God resisting it. Rejecting it. And standing firm. And standing straight. And you have a backbone to stand because you have the word of God. The pressure of the world will not make you fall. It says, I've written to you young men because he are strong. Why are they strong? The word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. Number one, we're saved by the word. Number two, we're searched and sharpened and shaped by the word. Number three, we're strengthened and stabilized by the word. Number four, we're sanctified through the word. Sanctified through the word. That means that the Adamic nature is dealt with. The inbred sin is dealt with. The carnality of the heart is dealt with. The kind of original sin, the root of sin that produces the branches and the fruits of sins, all that is dealt with, were sanctified by the word. It's the word that makes you to know the necessity of sanctification. It's the word that makes you to know the possibility of sanctification. It is the word that makes you to know the provision for sanctification. It's the word that leads you to pray for sanctification. It is the word that makes you to know the kind of consecration that is needed for sanctification. It is the word of God that gives you assurance when the sanctification is effected in your heart. It's the word of God that leads you and guides you to live the sanctified life. Sanctified by the word. In John chapter 17 verse 17. John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification is a real experience. The sanctification of the heart. The circumcision of the heart. And it's that that gives us the holiness of heart and holiness of life. And it is the word that effects it within us. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might cleanse and sanctify sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish then number five we're sealed and will become secured by the word sealed secured by 
the word Isaiah chapter 8. In Isaiah chapter 8, reading from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. Bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. Seal it in their hearts. That's what brings us the security. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob. And I will look for him. Behold I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel. For the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits. And unto the wizards that peep and that mortar, should not he people seek unto their God for the living to the dead to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. It is when you give your heart to the word, you give your attention to the word, that's how you are sealed. That's how you have security. And every time the devil comes with his lie, every time those false prophets come with their false teaching, you go back to the law, back to the word, back to the law, back to the testimony of the Lord. And it says to the law and to the testimony, if those preachers, if those prophets, if those seminarians, if those theologians speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. And then now, number six, we submit to the word. You are submissive to the word. If the word is going to do its work in your heart, if it's going to get you saved, if it's going to get you stabilized, if it's going to get you strengthened, if the word is going to get you sanctified, if the word is going to seal you and give you security, you must be submissive unto the word. Submissive to the word of God. We're told in Romans chapter 8, chapter 8 verse 7. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 7. Romans 8. Reading from verse 7, it tells us, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The carnal mind is against God, against the word of God, against the doctrines of the Bible, against the teaching of the word of God. It's carnal. Then it's, but it says, but to be spiritually minded is, uh, sorry, in verse 7, it says, uh, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject, cannot be submissive to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Have you found somebody who has been coming to this church for such a long time? Long, long time. And yet you can see that he cannot be subject to the law of God. It's not controllable by the word of God. It's not submissive to the word of God. And you're wondering... And you're saying that he's been there for a long, long time. The reason is because he has not submitted to the word of God. He's not saved. He's not born again. And because he's not born again, it's impossible for a fish to fly. And it's impossible for a bird to swim. His nature has not been touched. His nature has not been transformed. Yes, sometimes he may want to go his way through and be one of those people you call workers. He knows the sin in the head. He doesn't have it in the heart. He is not submissive to the word of God. There's no salvation and there's no cleansing and there's no change of life. There's no change of character. There's no change of sanctification. And his wife is always complaining and saying, what kind of man is this? And he never misses any service, never misses any Bible study or any Sunday worship. But to be carnally minded is death. And because he's not really born again and he's carnal, he cannot submit himself to the word of God. But it's when, you are, when you believe the word of God, you accept the word of God, and you pray it in and you pray it through, then there is a change. And that change then makes us to see 
How the word of God has power and effect upon your life. Number seven, we're successful through the word. Successful through the word. In Joshua chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. Joshua chapter 1, reading from verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. The success comes by obedience to the word, by yieldedness to the word, by submission to the word. By giving yourself, your mind, your heart, your life under the control to the control of the word of God. In Psalm 1, reading from verse 1. Psalm 1, reading from verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor seateth in the seat of discomfort, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, because he's meditating on the word, because he's living by the power, the knowledge, and the admonition of the word, because of that whatsoever he doeth, he shall prosper. We we'll come to Matthew chapter 5, the passage we have studied today and the Lord is telling us, giving us the assurance of the permanence of this word, of the infallibility of this word and is giving us the uh, kind of uh, imperishability of this word, that this word of God is imperishable. It says, don't ever think, don't ever imagine in your mind that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have not come to destroy but I have come to fulfill for Verily I say unto you. And this is what he's still saying to his people today. And this is what he's still saying to his church today. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one judge or one title. Shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. I pray this word will be fulfilled in my heart. It will be fulfilled in your heart. It will be fulfilled in your family. It will be fulfilled in our church. I pray that every member of our church will take the word of God to heart. And then everywhere we go, this word will be our guide. This word will be the light in front of us. This word will be the power in our life. And this word will be fulfilled in the whole church in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up now and pray until the word becomes the power, the authority, the assurance in your life, in your character, in your behavior, in everything that you do. Why don't you tell the Lord, oh Lord, thank you very much for the word that you have given me today. And then you come, you submit yourself to this imperishable word, to this irrevocable word, and to this inspired word, to this infallible word, to this word that is very, very sure. And then you say, Lord, I want your word to be fulfilled in my life. Your word to be fulfilled in me. It begins at salvation. Begins at salvation. Begins at salvation. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Those old habits, they pass away. The soul's sinful characters, they pass away. And the word of God cleanses us. The word of God washes us. Saved by the word. Saved by the word. We're saved from all sins. By the power of this word. This word that can never pass away. The infallible word. Take it to heart. Believe it in your heart. Accept it in your heart. Stand on it. And say, Lord, I thank you. And you will not, you will not try to modify the world. You will not try to change the world. You give yourself to it. Let the world search you. Search me, O oh God. And know my heart today. See, if there be any wicked way in me. Cleanse me, wash me, purge me, 
make me clean. Saved by the word. If you are not saved, you have been neglecting the word. If you are not cleansed, you have been neglecting the word. If you are not purged, you have been neglecting the word. If your old rascality is still there, you're still rascal. You're still rough. You're still not behaving like a follower of Christ. If that kind of rascal behavior is not there, you have not allowed the world to have an impact in your life to save you. We are saved by the world. Cleansed by the world. Uh, cleanse your brain from the thought of that evil habit. He will cleanse your life from all those bad, corrupt habits. Saved by the word. Cleansed by the word. Let the word search you. Searched by the word. Sharpened by the word. Shaped by the word. He'll mold you into the proper shape by the word of God. He'll melt you. Then he'll mold you. He'll make you the kind of man you ought to be. The kind of woman you ought to be. A Christian wife. A Christian husband. A Christian mother. A Christian father. A Christian child. He will mold you to the kind of child you ought to be. Lying will vanish away. Stealing will vanish away. Bad habit will vanish away. Disobedience will vanish away. And deliberate rebellion against the word of the school authority will vanish away. When this word of God cleanses your heart, when you are saved, if you are still living in sin, you are not born again yet. If you are still living in lies, you are not being cleansed by the word, you have not been saved. Why don't you come to the Lord today and be saved by the word. Saved by the word. Sharpened and shaped by the word. Strengthened by the word. Temptation will come. Pressures will come. Opposition will come. Persecution will come. It is the word of God that strengthens your heart. It's the word of God that strengthens your conviction. It is this word, imperishable word, that makes you the kind of man, the kind of woman you ought to be. And then you have a purpose of heart, a purpose of life. Like Daniel, Daniel purpose in his heart. That he will not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Or with the wine which he drank. Is this word of God that strengthens you? We're strengthened by the word. And we're stabilized, established by the word. I write unto you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. Young men become strong. Young women become strong. Against the peculiar temptations of the young. Because the word of God abides in you. Receive the word. Believe the word. Meditate on the word. Practice the word. Take in the word and let the strength, the might, the power in the word begin to walk in your life. We're sanctified by the word. This sanctification, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. For God has called us unto holiness. He has not called us into uncleanness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It is the word of God that makes that holiness possible. Holiness at home. Holiness in the place of work. 
Holiness on the street. Holiness in the bus. Holiness in the village. Holiness when you go on a journey. Holiness among strangers. Holiness among your relatives. Holiness within. Holiness around. Holiness in your appearance. Holiness in your thought. Sanctification. It is by the word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the head of the church. He so loved the church, he gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. Or the washing of water by the word. That he might present you unto himself, part of the glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that you should be holy is a word that accomplishes it that you should be holy and without blemish give the word a chance in your life the sharp two-edged sword will circumcise your heart And then you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, that you may live. Is this word of God that seals us and we become secured under the protection of the word? And any challenge that comes to you, any decision you want to make to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. To the law and to the testimony. Any action of your hand, go back to the word, to the law and to the testimony. Any decisions you are trying to make to the law and to the testimony, go back to the word of God. Any relationship you are trying to form. Any business you are going to do. Any doctrine somebody is trying to present unto you, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Become submissive to the word. You are just a man of yesterday, a woman of yesterday. This word had been settled from all eternity, forever, O oh Lord. Thy word is settled in heaven. Be submissive to this word. He must increase, but you must decrease. Don't compete with the word of God. Don't exalt yourself about the word of God. Don't exalt your opinion about the word of God. Don't, do, don't exalt your desires above the word of God. Don't exalt your ego above the word of God. Be submissive to the word of God. Let the word of God take preeminence in your life. And only then, as you meditate on the word and live by the word, will you be successful in life in everything that you do.